Chapter 21 Ivory Towers Lauren, scholar of Argiv, arrived at Teresia City in the early summer of the fifth year after Yosha's fall. It had been a long journey from Penragon down to Corlys, then west by a coast-hugging boat across the storm-tossed shielded sea, north to Tomakul, and finally west over the wastes of the desert by camel to the borders of the city-state itself. Lauren wondered if, had she known the true distance of Teresia City from Argiv, she would have left her home at all. Indeed, many of her fellow nobles had tried to dissuade her from the journey, but she could not remain in Penragon. War fever had seized the nobility, a disease that apparently clouded the mind and convinced those infected by it that Urza, who had failed to save Yosha, was nonetheless their salvation from his brother's hordes. Lauren was less than convinced, yet in the drawing rooms and councils of Penrigan, her doubts were met by indifference at best and scorn at worst. She had opened correspondence with the Archmandrate years before, and when the Teresian scholar extended an invitation to her, she knew she would take it. Now, after long months, she stood at the gates of the great ivory metropolis. Teresia City rose above the neatly cultivated fields that surrounded it and was visible from miles away. The city was a gem set in a great ring of white stone. Its roofs were glass and crystal, and they scattered the sunlight like prisms, surrounding the streets below with rainbows. When the hard winter rain struck, Lauren was assured by her guide the entire metropolis would rattle and resound like a shaken tambourine. The city walls were of white stone hauled from the distant Colgan Mountains to the north by dwarves and their giantish slaves. Great towers of similar white stone ringed the city. They even reminded Lauren of chess pieces left behind by some idle god. Even these towers were works of art, they were lovingly decorated with bas-reliefs of mythological beasts, winged lions, and elephants. It was within one of these ivory towers that Lauren was to meet the supposed Mistress of the Order of the Ivory Towers, the Archmandrate of Teresia City, first among equals of the tower scholars. Lauren had no idea which tower belonged to the Archmandrite, but she inquired at the city's main gate. She hoped to send word of her arrival, then to settle in some inn within the city. Standing by the main gate was a broad-shouldered, bearded man with a wide-brimmed hat and a walking stick. As she spoke to the guards, the man removed the hat and mopped his brow with a rough handkerchief. He turned at the sound of her voice. You, you seek the mistress of the towers? he asked. Come, I'm heading there myself. He turned away and walked a few paces, and Lauren noticed he was lame in one leg. He hobbled along, resting heavily on a short metal stave. The man stopped and turned and looked back at the woman. Argivian! By your accent? He noted. Lauren nodded, puzzled. You would not be Lauren, the scholar from Penragon. I would be, replied Lauren. But you have the advantage in me. The man turned and limped back toward her. Lauren met him halfway. Felden, he said, bowing over her, offered his hand. Another scholar like yourself. You understand how I realized it was you. Lauren paused for a moment. I don't suppose there are many Argivians this far west? Felden nodded, and Lauren noticed he wore his long hair swept back over his ears, without a braid. In the warmth of the region, it was no surprise that the man was sweating profusely. Felden said, Your arrival has been expected. Come, let's see the Archmandrake together. Lauren motioned toward her guide, still standing by his camel. I have still to find lodging. Ah, allow me, said Felden. He hobbled forward two paces and ejaculated a rapid string of Falaji words, accented in a dialect that Lauren did not know. The guide responded in kind, and Felden fished a coin from his heavy coat. He tossed the coin to the guide, who caught it with a deft motion, smiled, and bowed. "'You're staying at the same inn I am,' said Felden, turning back to the Argivian scholar. "'Don't worry. If your guard has, guide has been less than an honorable man, you would not have gotten this far. Come along!' And with that, he limped forward again. He reminded Lauren of a bear, of a great bear, she thought, that had accidentally wandered out of the mountains and been mistaken for a human. She smiled at the thought and quickly caught up with him. The last was easy, since he paused every few steps to mop his brow and to complain of the heat. "'You are not from Teresia City, either?' said Lauren. "'Northern Uplands, near the glacier,' answered Felden. "'Came down here to check out the libraries. Useless things, the libraries. Couldn't find any runes that matched.' "'Matched?' asked Lauren. This, said Felden, holding up his metal walking stick. The head had been twisted into an ornate curve. It's a staff, Lauren said. More of a cane, returned Felden. 
But look along the shaft. Lauren reached out and steadied the proffered object. Along the length of it were markings, little more than scratches, but definitely organized in a recognizable pattern. They aren't Thran, are they? She said at last. Nor are they dwarven or goblin or anything else that anyone around here recognizes, said Felden. Found it in the glacier. I've been studying it. The cane? asked Lauren. The glacier, said Felden with a broad smile. The big one that pours into the Ronham Lake. Glaciers are frozen rivers, you know, and they move. Glaciers do. Not that you'd notice, but they slowly come down the mountains, scraping clean the land in their path. Found this one at the base of the glacier, and I've been seeing others buried within its heart. Felden continued his lecture as they continued around the perimeter of the walled city. They passed the first tower and came to a stop at the second. Felden bellowed another string of words at the female guard before the door, this time in a language Lauren did not even recognize. The guard bowed and stood aside for Lauren and Felden to enter. Sumifan, he said by way of explanation. They have a tonal quality in their language that makes discussion quite maddening sometimes. The same word has several different meanings if you vary the pitch. You study languages? asked Lauren. Well, I'm not studying glaciers, replied Felden with a private smile. Actually, I ended up knowing so much about language because I needed to know more information about glaciers and could not read the old scrolls or hear the old tales in their original tongues. So I learned language as a matter of course. Your specialty is artifacts, correct? Old Thran devices, Lauren specified. Like the two brothers, grunted Felden. Mishra, and uh, well, what's his name? Urza, said Lauren. Dangerous things, artifacts, said Felden, and there was something in his voice that made Lauren wary. By this time, they were past the reception hall and in the main room. The chamber was larger than Lauren had expected and was dominated by a heavy table of lacquered oak. The walls were lined with glass-fronted bookshelves, within which were locked all in manner of folios, scrolls, librums, and curios. Already the keeper of the tower, the archmandrate herself, was moving toward them. Gliding would have been a better term. The archmandrate herself, a sliver of a woman with a pale and narrow face, did not seem to walk, as much as she hovered above the stonework floor. Her long black hair spilled down her back in a single fall. Lauren thought of the way that she had worn her hair as a girl back in Tokasia's camp. That seemed a lifetime ago. Good Felden, said the archmandrite. Her voice was soft but firm. Lauren could sense at once that she was used to others quieting in order to hear her. The sweating scholar managed another low bow, then turned his entire body toward Lauren. A gracious Archmandrate, may I present Lorne the Argivian, scholar of Thrawn artifacts, also a woman kind enough not to interrupt while I go on about my glaciers. The Archmandrate curtsied gracefully, and Lorne returned the courtesy. It is good you have arrived. Let me introduce you to the others. The others consisted of a bald couple, man and woman, seated at the far end of the table. The man, a rotund little fellow, rose as they approached, Lauren extended a hand, but the man instead slapped both hands across his chest, his fingers touching his breastbone. Lauren took this as a greeting and lowered her hand accordingly. Felden smiled at the exchange, and the Archmandrite made no mention of it. Drevna, founder of the College of Latinam, said the bald man. The seated woman made a small coughing noise. It was little more than a clearing of the throat, but Lauren and Drafna noticed it. Drafna cleared his throat and said, Co-founder of the College of Latinam. That brought another small cough, and Drafna began the third time, co-founder of the present incarnation of the College of Latinam. He turned and looked at the woman, who said nothing but merely smiled. Uh, my wife and co-founder, Herkel. Lauren curtsied, and Herkel made the same breastbone-touching greeting as her husband. Hers was both more graceful and more tentative. Lauren stared at the bald woman. She had almost almond-shaped eyes, and ornate designs had been tattooed into the bare flesh of her shoulders. The Archmandrite motioned for Lauren to take a seat, while Felden pulled out a great dark oak chair for himself, hung his hat on one of the posts jutting from the headpiece, and lowered himself down, gripping his cane as he did so. "'I thank you for the invitation, Mistress of the Towers,' said Lauren, "'and I should tell you at the outset that I come with the knowledge of the Chief Artificer of Argive, though not as his representative.' "'That would be what's-his-name,' said Felden. Urza said the archmandrate levelly and raised her hand to signal the servants. The archmandrate seemed young to Lauren at first blush, but now she realized the woman was older than she. The grace of her movements had been honed by years of practice. A servant, another Sumifan, arrived with coffee, 
It smelled of honey and was not as thick and syrupy as the Falaji mixtures which with Lauren was familiar. Despite this lack of official authorization, continued Lauren, I have brought along the notes on Thran artifacts that the Argivians have collected over the years, culminating in Tokasia's notes from her digs. She turned to Felden. Tokasia taught me what I know about artifacts, and she also taught Urza and Mishra. To the Archmandrate, she said, Unfortunately, Urza would not allow me to bring any information about his own work. I had to travel through innumerable miles of land held by his brother, and he feared any data sent might fall into the wrong hands. Understood, said the Archmandrate, and in that word made sure that Lauren knew there would be no questions concerning Urza's work, at least not at this meeting. But you do carry other knowledge that is valuable to us, the Archmandrate continued. You knew the brothers' artificers as children. Yes, said Lauren, though I was very young at the time myself. Did they hate each other even then? asked the mistress of the ivory towers. Lauren paused and thought for a moment. No, they were rivals, I suppose. All brothers are. Urza was smarter, or rather was more studious. Mishra was nicer. He got along better with others. This would be the same Mishra that leveled Krug? inquired Felden, his voice dripping with irony. The Archmandrate ignored, instead saying, But they did not hate each other when you knew them? No, Lauren turned to Felden. But they have changed. I have not seen Mishra since Tokasia, our mentor, died. But he is said to be a cruel desert warlord, a, a demon to Argivians and Corlysians alike. Is he? said Drafna. Lauren shook her head. I cannot say what he is now or why, but it's difficult for me to equate the young man I remember telling stories by the fire with the butcher of Krug. Time changes us all, said the Archmandrite. But what of his brother? What of Urza? Lauren shook her head again. Urza's been very hurt, very, very badly. He seems to have pulled back into himself. I talked to him just once to tell him I'm making this journey. He was not cold, but detached, as if everything was a cryptic message that could be solved only if he had one right cipher. The Archmandrate leaned forward in her chair. So you do not think there will be a resolution between the two without further conflict? No, said Lauren flatly. I don't think there will be. In Argiv, when I left, they were building a string of towers along the borders filled with clockwork soldiers of Urza's design. There are new mines across the hinterlands, and most of the streams have been dammed to provide additional power. When I passed through Tomakul and Zegon, portraits of Mishra hung everywhere, and people felt he would lead them to a great and powerful future. No, there will be no resolution without war. Told you, said Felden. The Archmandrate frowned. What does it matter what two screaming brats do on the far side of the continent? said Drafna sharply. It does not involve us at all. Let them brawl. Leave us to our own work. If they would rather fight than study, it is, is it our responsibility? It's more than that, said Felden. Things like this have a tendency to spread. First, it's the Falaji against the oceans. Now it's against the Argivians and the Corlesians. How long before we get dragged into things on one side or the other? This Kadir the Falaji is facing eastward with his forces. We're to the west. We're not his worry, said Drafna. Really, snapped Felden at the bald man. I was talking to a Serinthian merchant this morning, apparently Mishra's devil girl apprentice. Ashnod the Uncaring was in Sarinth, negotiating for a timberland and mineral resources of the state. Apparently the negotiations consist of Mishra giving Sarinth the choice of either handing over the goods or having the Falaji come and take them. I'd like to see them try, offered Drafna. That's what the Zagoni said, muttered Felden, and they're being bled dry as a vassal state of the Falaji domains, the oceans too, for that matter. The Kadir's representatives have approached Teresa's city's council as well, said the Archmandrite softly. They have been politely refused. What will happen when they arrive with their dragon engines at our great gates? Or at yours, Drafna, asked Felden. The co-founder of the College of Latinam made a harumphing noise but said nothing. Teresia City is an ancient place, said the Archmandrate, speaking to Lauren, but for Drafna's benefit. It has many defenses. The great white towers that ring the central city are but one of them, but these defenses are old and might not be sufficient to withstand an assault from without. Our people have been at peace for longer than any remember, and they have no love for war. It doesn't matter if you love war or not, said Drafna, if one is coming your way. Exactly, thundered Felden. That's what we need to prepare for. Otherwise, the various Western nations and their knowledge and scholars will be picked off one at a time. 
You could ally with Urza, said Loren, since Mishra is your closest fear. The Archmandrate and Felden looked at each other, then at Loren. What's his name may be as bad as Mishra, said Felden. The example of his defense of Yosha is not encouraging. We do not want to avoid one master merely to accept another, said the Archmandrite, softly but clearly. Lauren thought about the mistress's words. That's true, she said. I'm afraid Corliss has become little more than a province of Argiv. More and more of its decisions come from Penragon in the name of coordinating the war effort. Exactly, said Felden again. We have to find a third path. The Archmandrite leaned forward, and Lauren felt herself drawn forward as well. We have many scholars within our walls and know of more scattered through the western part of the continent. I propose we gather them here to form a union, a conclave, a gathering of knowledge that is able to stand up to either of the brothers' machines. I also know several Serinthian scholars who started packing the moment Ashnot arrived in their capital, said Felden, and there are some shamans and witchwomen from the near glacier who could aid as well. The reputed song mages of Sumifa might cooperate, as well as the astrologers and diviners who have fled Zegon, added the Archmandrate. No, said Drafna. The others looked at the bald man. No, he repeated firmly. This is not for us. Latnam is far enough away. We do not have to worry about desert tribes. We are not interested. There was a shadow of a cough, so quiet none would normally hear it. Drafna looked at his wife, who cleared her throat again. Felden raised an eyebrow, and the Archmandrate kept her face a passionless mask. Drafna scowled. I mean to say we shall see, said Drafna, shooting a glare at the other scholar of Latinem. I have reservations, but we will make all our resources and knowledge available. He took a deep breath and laced his pudgy fingers together. After all, we might learn something as well. The Archmandrate turned to Loren. And you, Loren of Penrigan, will you join our union? Loren sat in silence for a moment. She had come seeking knowledge, but was it knowledge that might be used against either of the brothers? Didn't she owe Urza and Mishra more than that? Could she turn over copies of Tokasia's notes to people who, even with the intention of defending themselves, would search them for a way to defeat the brothers? She thought of the ever-growing mines and factories that filled her homeland, and of the other noble families that seemed determined to declare Urza their patron saint. Of the Falaji who seemed to have defied Mishra. Would Tokasia want either man to use the knowledge she might have taught them in this fashion? Warren took a deep breath like a diver about to plunge off the pier. Yes, she said at last, I will join you.